Hello, 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 Scope Land. Blessings and greetings to each of you. Um, come on in, come on in. We are uh, a minute late. Um, I think I see the man of God, the Reverend John Montplacier. How you doing, my brother? Bless you. Um, come on in, come on in, come on in. We, we're going to do this scope. Um, um, hey, Latrice, bless you, bless you. Um, I see the bishop, West Coast. Hey, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Hey, 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 um, Reverend John, everything's well. How about yourself? How are your daughters? Please give them a hug for me if you would, please. Um, uh, bishop Timbo, what's happening? West Coast flavor, old oh, man. All right, all right, good. I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear that. Um, we 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 got to look out for our girls. We got to look out for our girls. Okay. Um, you're about to make some people upset with this one. <laughs> Oh, here's Adara. Here's Adara. Hey, everybody. Um, um, hey, Pastor Prescott. Uh, hey, hey, Pastor Prescott. Hey, hey Jen. Darlene, how you doing? Hey, Darfs. Hey, hey. Uh oh, there's cousin. There's cousin. I can't there's see. There's cousin you. Kyle. Okay. Who else is on there? I can't see you. Uh, the Reverend John is on there. Oh, hey. Um, Hi, everybody. The Trace is on there. Darlene came in. Who who did I miss? Did I miss anybody? Timbo said I'm getting ready to upset some people. Uh, you, but uh, Tim, Tim, you don't even know what I'm gonna say yet, man. <laughs> okay, I'm about to go join and get some food. Okay. Do. Okay. So, uh, Adara says she's going to join and get some food. Um, uh, you like this topic? Okay. <laughs> Lord, help us, God. Help us, Lord. Okay, my Lord. We're going to give, give a few more folks a little bit more time to get in. Um, and then we're going to see uh, where this is going to take us. Wow. Wow. Um, we're going to see. Amen. God is good. God is good. Amen. Amen. It don't matter what you say about it. We know this is a touchy topic. Yes, sir. It's very touchy. It's very, very touchy. The the, the poor D is here. Okay. Here's crazy Adara. Um, you all excuse me for drinking water while I'm on the this, on this, on this scope. So Adara, daughter number two, Adara's on. Okay. Minister-elect Adara Butler. She's on the trace, has asked followers, this, but I'm still at work. I will definitely catch the replay. Okay, 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 Bishop. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm expecting you and the Reverend John to give me some some critique and feedback about this scope. To let me uh, to tell me um what the deal is. Okay, all right, yes, yes. Now for those of you, okay, good. For those of you that are coming on, as you caught from the title of the scope, um. <laughs> Okay, Daryl. Nobody asked you for all that. I'm I'm a little parched. Do you mind? As you caught from the from the title of the scope, we're going to be talking about honorariums, okay? Ministerial etiquette, and where honorariums are concerned. All right. Um, those of you that are coming in, let me uh, just tell you right at the back. Grab your Bibles, okay? Um, and we don't need to add to the controversy, okay? By not having our Bibles available, okay? So we just I'm just gonna cut right to the chase and, and to the chase and tell you that that's gonna be the deal right off the top. So um get your Bibles on. Okay, don't be long winded, Daddy. Okay. Okay, you got it. She's only saying that, folks, because she wants a ride home. Okay. I'm I'm gonna put her stuff on blast. Just like that. Okay. So um grab your Bibles. Um grab your Bibles, get your Bibles ready. We're gonna we're gonna set uh some foundation with some scriptures first. Okay, um, and then we're gonna see facts only. I got I got stuff to do. Okay, um, <laughs> yeah, I need to bring it. Okay, yeah, I have to bring it. Um, God is not letting me off the hook. So um, we we're gonna try and be balanced, as I said before, be sound and be practical. We're going to endeavor to be balanced, to be sound, and to be practical. Okay, and we get the balance. From the Word of God, balance and soundness from the Word of God, and it's not. It is. We really shouldn't be endeavoring to do anything in the in the kingdom of God that we cannot substantiate and 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 found that is build foundation upon the Word of God. All right. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So I guess some more folks are going to be coming in. I don't want to belabor the point. I want to jump right into it. And um, 
I guess we might as well be churchy since we're talking about ministerial etiquette. And let's open up with a word of prayer. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all the prayer that I use to pray when I get ready to preach. Okay? And this is the prayer that I use when I get ready to preach. It's the prayer that the Lord has given to me. And here it is. Father, open our minds that we may understand the scriptures. Open our eyes that we may see the wonderful things in your instruction. And open our hearts to take heed to all that you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. That's our opening prayer, all right? Succinct, to the point. And um, we uh, want to get into it. So, um, <laughs> honorariums, 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 ministerial etiquette where honorariums is concerned, okay? Does the Bible have something to say about it? Okay, well, let's see. Let me just say this to you. The Bible may not be necessarily explicit about it in terms of the word honorarium, but the Bible does have some implications. It is implicit about this whole notion of honorariums. Okay, so let's start out with that. The first scripture I want to take us to is Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. Okay, um, prayerfully, as we're walking through these verses of scripture, when I call out the references, hopefully some of them will... Uh, sound familiar to you, okay? Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, verse 7. And I'm using the New Living Translation. I use the New Living Translation. I was born and raised on the King James Version, still like it a lot. But uh, in an attempt to be relevant within the context of our culture, I like to use a translation that is more uh, uh, closer to the language that we speak on an everyday basis, okay? All right, so hopefully I'm not offending anybody by not quoting King James Version, okay? I am saved, I love the Lord, and I love the King James Version, but I believe it is my responsibility to be relevant in this particular cultural context with, with, within which we do ministry, okay? Um, relevance was defined by one of my pastors one time as the ability to communicate traditional truths in contemporary language, okay? All right. So Luke 10 and 7, New Living Translation says, don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work deserve their pay. Mm. The last clause, those who work deserve their pay. All right. Let's go on. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. And these are just going to be a few scripture verses, but God knows there are so many more. Prayerfully, I will stimulate you, and um, you'll move to the place of uh, doing your own study and seeing what God has to say to you, especially if you are a minister. Especially if you are a minister. I, I believe this is very, very apropos uh, and, and very pertinent to the life of a minister. Okay? Um, 1 Corinthians 9 and 11. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? Okay. Verse 12. If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? Hmm. All right. Okay. Are you all still with me? The numbers have waned down already. Staying right in 1 Corinthians 9th chapter. And let's skip down to verses 14, the verse 14. In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Wow. Okay. I want to look at another passage of scripture. I believe it's in Timothy. It's not in, it's not in the notes, but it comes right uh, to mind. And let me see if I can find it here. I believe it's in Timothy. And those of you who are biblical scholars, um, feel free to help me. But Paul says to Timothy, who goes to a warfare at any time of his own charges? Okay, those of you who are familiar with that, if you know where it is, shout it back to me um, so that we can go there. Because we need to see this in the word of God. Okay, I believe it's in Timothy. I'm not too sure if it's 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy. If you know where it is, shout it back to me. Um, all right. Well, I'm here in 1 Timothy, the 5th chapter, verse 17. It says, elders who do their work should be respected and paid well. 
especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. All right? Um, so, there it is. Paul lays it, Paul lays it out right there. Um, let me see if I could call this up. Let me just do a, a search of the scriptures, if you would. Um, talk about the muzzling of the ox. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm looking for where Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, um, he says, who goes to a warfare of his own charges? All right. He go, who goes to a warfare of his own charges? If those of you who have a, a quick Bible uh, concordance, if you can just pull that up and just let me know where it is. I did not intend to look at this particular verse of scripture, but the Holy Spirit just brought it to the forefront of my consciousness. So I believe that we need to look at this verse of scripture as well. All right. Um, I'm not bringing it up in first Timothy. So uh, let's see if it's in second Timothy. Who goes to a warfare of his own charges at any time? Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe Paul starts it off by saying uh, the husband man that labors must be um, first partaker of the fruit. Okay. No, he doesn't start off that way. I actually found that pers that that particular verse of scripture. Um, that's Second Timothy, the second chapter, the fourth verse, um, and he says, "Hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy their fruit." But Paul says, um, also he's talking to Timothy. He says to him, "Who goes to a warfare of his own charges at any time?" Okay, we're gonna we're gonna find that. Okay, Second Timothy two and six. Okay, yes I did, yes I did. Second Timothy two and six. All right. No, that that's that's hardworking farmers. Yes, I found that. But there's a verse of scripture where Paul asks the question. He says, "Who goes to a warfare of his own of his own charges at any who 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 goes to a warfare of his own charges?" I believe it's in Second Timothy. I could be wrong. Okay. It might be in First Corinthians. All right, we'll get there. I learned. I, I gave you these particular verses of scripture, these passages, to lay a foundation. And by looking at this foundation, um, just these verses alone, I think it's clear that God does not have an issue with ministers being compensated for their work. Okay, with ministers being compensated for their work. Okay. This covers the entire gamut, the, the entire gamut of ministry function and ministry operation. Whether you're a full-time evangelist, whether you're a pastor, whether you're an elder on staff. Somebody said 1 Corinthians 9 and 7. Okay, who's that? Uh, call me Hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 1 Corinthians 9 and 7. I want to see that. So we was already in 1 Corinthians. Did I, I, did, I miss, did I miss it? Okay, yes, thank you. It was, okay. What soldier has to pay? His own expenses. What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of his fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink of some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking about oxen when he said this? Only about oxen? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us that the one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. And then I read to you 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 11, verse, okay? So whether you are a full-time evangelist, whether you are a minister on staff of, at another church, or whether you are a full-time pastor, um, if you're doing anything ministerial related, okay, there is nothing wrong with having an honorarium. We got it right there, okay? We just put it right out there, okay? We just... We, no no warming up in the bullpen. We just gonna throw the pitches out there. We just gonna start swinging, and we're gonna go for it. There's nothing wrong with an honorarium. Um, what happens is the process of the honorarium being realized and being effectuated. That's where the issue comes in, saints. Okay, and that's where we need to apply ministerial etiquette. The proper way 
to handle the issue of honorariums, okay? You can look throughout the entire scriptures, okay, and see that it is God's intention that those who work for him get paid. And you know what? God pays very well, okay? Now, here's the thing. God doesn't pay like the world pays, okay? Sometimes he puts you through some paces. He puts you through some changes. He puts you through some things, okay? And you may not necessarily get paid up front the way you think you should or the way you want to. But here's the deal. Whether God pays you on the back end or whether he pays you on the front end, he will pay you, okay? Now, how he makes that happen comes about in a, in a, in a myriad of different, different ways. And what happens to us is we violate the process of God, seeing to it that we are compensated because we insert human wisdom, we, ins we insert worldly wisdom, we insert perversion into the process, we go about things in some very shady ways, we do some things that are just unethical, that are immoral, that are ungodly, that are unbiblical, and that are just downright not right, okay? And there's a whole lot of reasons why this happens, okay? Um, we have some young preachers on here. We had some, okay? One of the things I want to I want to caution the young preachers about is to not allow yourselves to become jaded when you experience being mistreated in this area, okay? Let me say that. Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm really going to go in on this scope. I'm really going to go in, okay? Okay? I'm going in. Do not allow yourself to become jaded when you experience some of the darker sides of ministry as you go forth to preach, all right? Because, um, and I'm praying that it doesn't happen to you, but I know humans, and I know human nature. We live in a fallen world, okay? God bless you, Latrice. And just, just some of us, not some of us, we got problems, okay? And sometimes we do things that are just not right. And there's a very real possibility that as you're navigating through ministry, as you're developing, as you're matriculating, as God is, 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 is making you, that you'll come into contact with some individuals who do some really grimy stuff. Yes, I use the word grimy, okay? And they'll abuse you, they'll use you, okay? And they'll they'll use all kind of manipulative tactics to spiritualize it, to make it seem like there's something wrong with you when you don't accept the way they mistreat you. Uh this is part of this is part of your making. This is this is this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, it's not about the filthy lucre. I mean, I've heard all kinds of stuff, okay? Let me let me explain something to you, okay? If you minister, if you put your time in, if you study like you're supposed to, if you study like you're supposed to, if you've been called of God, all right, um, and if you do everything you're supposed to do, there's nothing wrong with you being compensated to minister. The issue come, the issue becomes how we go about making that compensation. And sometimes some some pastors, okay, I'll say this, who are poor managers. Hey, hey, Tabitha, some pastors who are poor managers of the resources of the house that they are in charge of, uh, the, the house that they are in charge of, excuse me, because they don't manage the resources well, because they don't plan the way they should, they should, they should plan, because they don't count up the costs, uh, and because they are more concerned about making themselves look good, all right, they will have someone come in, they'll bring them in the minister, they'll, they'll like the anointing that's on the person's life, Okay, um, they'll like what the person has to say. They'll like the way the Lord used the individual, and they'll bring that person in. Okay, because they're using that individual to bring something to the house to make them look good, not necessarily to advance the kingdom, and not necessarily for the health of the flock. Okay, yes, I'm saying it. Okay, because it's real. I've been there. I've experienced it. Okay, not all pastors. Some pastors just don't plan well. They just don't use wisdom. Okay, and then some of them are just oblivious to certain mechanics about the business side of the ministry. The ministry is not all business, but there is a business side to it. And so as a young preacher, sometimes you go someplace and you'll pour your heart into this thing. You'll lay before God. You'll do what you're supposed to do. Okay? And then, you know, you're expecting individuals to do the right thing, and they do the wrong thing. Okay? And let me tell you something, young preachers. It doesn't necessarily stop as you get older. Just last year, now I've been in the ministry over 25 years. I've been pastoring 16 years, okay? And I've been in the ministry as a preacher for 25 years. I've been in ministry, period, for over 30-some years. I've been in ministry since I was 15. I'm going to be 53 uh, two weeks from today, all right? And I went to minister at a church in October. I went to minister at a church in October. And I'm not the kind of individual 
you know, who makes a big deal about money, okay? Now, I'm saying big deal, okay? I'm about to change, and I'm about to make a deal about it, okay? And I'm going to explain what that's all about shortly, okay? But I don't make a big deal about it, and I don't, I'm not one of these individuals where I'm not coming unless there's a certain amount of money on the table. I don't do that, and I don't knock those who do it because I understand why they do it. But I went to this church. It wasn't a small church, not by any stretch of the imagination. It was a well-established church, okay? The pastor had asked me, you know, to come for months, for months, for months, for months, for months. And I finally said yes. And I did, I did something that I don't like to do, um, which is leave the pulpit that I'm responsible for on a Sunday morning, okay? But I did it. I knew the pastor. We are actually friends, okay? We have a, we have a great, great relationship. And I went. And I ministered. I, I, I did the best I could. I believe I did a great job because of the feedback that I got. And the, and the Lord said he was pleased. That's a whole other message. And so they handed me, you know, the envelope. I put it in my pocket and kept it moving. And when I got into the car and, 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 and passed the envelope to my wife and she opened it, she really didn't want to give it to me because she knew that it wasn't right. But the amount of money, what the, amount, what the check was for was atrocious, saints. It was atrocious. And so here I am. Been in ministry over some 30 some odd years and it still happens. Now, I believe that the pastor to this day does not know what went on. The church is structured in such a way that the officers handle what's going on. And the reason why I know he doesn't know what happened is because, oh, I'm not getting the hearts anymore. Okay. <laughs> the reason why I know he doesn't know what happened is because he's demonstrated generosity in so many other ways. Okay. But I could not, from an ethical standpoint of view, from a godly standpoint of view, Go and make waves about that. I just had to suck it up. So I'm telling you as young ministers that even when you move down, even hey, Kayla Leon, Kayla, hey, Kayla Leon I, saw the, I, I, got the, I got the email. I didn't look at it yet. I'm going to look at it, okay? So even as you matriculate, you move through um, you know, the, the, your ministerial life, you still very, may very well experience not being treated appropriately. Don't let it jade you. Don't let it corrupt you. Don't let it pervert you. Don't say, okay, because they got me, I will never be got again. And then a seed is sown into your heart and a root of bitterness begins to grow in. And now you go into the opposite, opposite, opposite extreme where you adopt a hireling's mentality. Okay? Because the hireling is only concerned about what tangible recompense is in it for me. They put that first and then they approach the ministry aspect of it second. So how do you make him aware of what happened without him feeling you're asking for money. Latrace, the Spirit of the Lord told me, leave it alone. He said, leave it alone. He said, if I create the, the environment or the circumstance for you to address it, then you address it. He said, but don't you address it. You just leave it alone. Now, what he did tell me was, um, when, it comes down to, when it comes down to ministry, okay, when it comes down to ministry, uh, if I'm, if I'm given an invitation to go back to decline, okay? Because, see, let me tell you something about God. I don't care what anybody tells you. I don't care how spiritual they make it sound, okay? God does not want you to be abused, okay? God does not. He does not operate in abuse. It does not come from him. It may happen because we're in a fallen world, and there may be some things that he works through, Okay, there may be some things that he works and, and does as he's working through it, but abuse does not come from God, okay? God does not want you to put yourself in that circumstance, in that situation. So he said to me, he said, you just don't go back. You decline the invitation. Now, if the pastor keeps pressing and he keeps saying yada, 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 then God said, I'll show you how to deal with the situation delicately because, again, and I want to say this to, to the young ministers, because I've seen a, a lot of young ministers tainted, and I've seen them perverted, and I've seen them corrupted, corrupted, and I've seen them abused because of, you know, going to these things. And now they become jaded, and they, and they say, okay, well, you know, if this is what it's all about, then I got I to gotta just go for mine. Whatever you do, understand that that is not acceptable practice from God's standpoint of view, all right? And don't let it jade you. Don't let it corrupt your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, the fourth chapter, the 23rd verse, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. Okay? What that means, you got to guard your heart because your heart is the seat of your motives. Your heart determines 
why you do what you do. And if your heart becomes corrupted, then guess what? You're going to be on a corrupt path, okay? For uh, Proverbs 23 and 7, the King James Version, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, okay? Every, I thought about doing this scope before I did it, all right? So guard your heart. Yes, you're going to be injured. Some things are going to hurt you, but don't let it seep down to the point where it begins to sow a seed of bitterness and a root becomes, and now you've got this tree that is growing up where you're producing all kinds of fruit of, of, of corruption and bitterness and perversion. Okay, so, so th that's going to happen. Okay, that's going to happen. Now, um, the issue is, what is the proper etiquette where honorariums are concerned? What is the proper etiquette where honorariums are, co are concerned? All right? So again, let's understand, there's nothing wrong with an honorarium. However, there is an etiquette, all right? There is an etiquette. The first thing you have to understand is where does God have you at in your ministry? Okay, where are you at in your ministry? What, what is the place that God has for you? Let me, let me use this analogy if I, if I can, okay? Um, we all have heard of Bishop T.D. Jakes. Incredible preacher, okay, in my opinion. I think he's a great preacher. I'm, 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 he's, he's one of the preachers that I admire and I respect because of how God uses him in such a wide ranging of, a wide range of, of, of arenas. Do I agree with everything he does? No. Okay? Nobody agrees with everything that everybody does. So let's just get that on the table. That's not the issue. The issue is God has blessed the man. Okay? Where does God have you at this time in your ministry? I'm going to talk about that in a moment, Latrice. Um, um, and he commands a certain honorarium, okay? Now, I happen to have been one of the few individuals who has actually been able to witness the evolution of his ministry. I saw him 20, it'll be 27 years, the third Sunday in October, actually minister at a church here in the area where I live, here in Freeport, Long Island, New York. And the church was a small church. They used to call it an underground church because they were actually meeting in the back of a bookstore, okay? They were meeting in the back of a bookstore. They weren't even supposed to be meeting there, okay? And Bishop Jays came and he preached. I'll never forget him out, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. He preached, Tell the Devil I Changed My Mind. It was a message about the prodigal son. And I've seen the man's ministry ev evolve ever since then. And I'm telling you, Saints, I'm telling you, he's actually told this story, so I'm not disparaging him. I saw the poverty on him. I saw it on him, okay? I saw the poverty on him. I witnessed it with these two eyes that's here in his head, okay? I had a whole lot more hair myself back then, <laughs> but I witnessed it. But the man preached his brains out, okay? Two years later, and actually, I went that next, that was a Saturday night. It was the third Sunday in October, 1989. I went that next Sunday morning, and I was raving to my pastor about him. Have you ever heard of this preacher called Bishop Thomas Jakes? Bishop, Because he wasn't TD then. He was Bishop Thomas Jakes out of the, out of the, out of the hills of West Virginia. He was like, no, I've never heard of him. I was, I was raving and raving and raving about him. Two years later, my pastor went to hear him preach. And my pastor said, my pastor then said he was hearing him, he was listening to him preach, and he was preaching about the blood. He said he doesn't know what happened. And next thing he knew, he woke up, and he was underneath the pew bench. It was, this was a church, uh, this was a conference of pastors. There was only pastors in the room. My pastor said he woke up, and he was underneath the church bench, and he turned to the right, and he saw bodies all over the floor. Bishop Jakes had preached under such an anointing that people were slain in the spirit just from his preaching. Two years after that, I went to see him. My wife took me for my birthday as a birthday treat to go see him at a church in Brooklyn. It was a 7.30 service. The fire marshals had closed the doors of the church. And this was a huge theater that set like about 2,000, 3,000 people. The fire marshals had shut the doors of the church at 4.30 because there was too many people in there. And the man just ascended from there, okay? And so when you look at where he is, he commands, he commands a certain level of respect, that just people that just come just to hear him. The man is worth every dime that he commands, okay? He's worth it, okay? You may not agree with it, and that's your, your prerogative, but when you deal with basic business dollars and cents, the man is worth it, okay? I'm not at that level. I'm not at that level. You got to know where you are, okay? And a lot of times we violate ministerial etiquette because we're not realistic with where we are, where you, where our ministry is. My ministry is not on the level of T.D. Jakes, so I don't have a right to expect a T.D. Jakes honorarium, okay? That's crazy. You have to know where you are. And the way to really know where you are is to ask God and to prepare yourself unconditionally for him to tell you where your ministry is, okay? 
Now, for years, because I first entered into ministry as a musician, okay? And for years, God would not let me charge people to play. He would just, you know, whatever they, whatever they give you, you just receive, okay? Until one day, uh-oh, here we go, phone drop. Until one day, I had a situation. I had to leave something, came up. I'll catch the replay when I get them. Okay, okay. Um, until one day, how do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Okay, oh, that's something else. I'll, I'll get into that um, shortly. I'm going to try and come back to that, okay? One day, I went and did a music ministry assignment. And I, well, I can tell you what this was. I was there for like three, four hours, lugged all my equipment, and, and, and played and sang, and back to the preacher, whatever, and got home, and the folks had given me $50. Okay, now listen. Four hours. Let, let, okay, let's just, do, let's just do basics here. Okay, four hours at $50? Come on, people. That's $12.50 an hour. Now, you mean to tell me God is all right with you being paid $12.50 an hour when you're doing work of eternal ramifications? Absolutely not. Okay? Absolutely not. Okay, and so I went home, and my wife said, okay, we got to change. She didn't beat me up, okay? She what kind of man are you? You let somebody do that to you. Because she understood I had a servant's heart. And as long as you have a servant's heart, you're going to be all right. Remember that. Remember that. If you don't get anything else out of this scope, remember that. As long as you have a servant's heart, you're going to be all right. She said, we're going to have to start setting contracts up when people ask you to minister we're going to have to ask them what they want you to do. We're going to have to tabulate it, calculate the time, and this is, is going to, there's going to be a fee schedule. And guess what? And God said, this is your help me. I gave it to you. This is the wisdom that's coming from her through me. You're going to follow through. God had released me at that point because I love how she showed you grace. Yes, Darlene, Dar 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 and she's still doing it, okay? Here we are 20-some odd years later, and the woman is still showing me grace. She's actually the grace of God to my life, okay? I, I, I can't, okay. I get excited when I talk about my wife, so I got to stay focused. I stay focused, okay? Because um, the girl is just bad. I just love her. The woman is just bad. Okay, so anyway, okay, stay focused, Darren. Stay focused. Stay focused. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and so God had released me then. But when I started preaching, now watch this. Because I had I had the twin call of music ministry and, 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 the, and the ministry of the word at work in my life, okay? When I started preaching, God made a separation between who I was as a minister of music and who I was as a preacher. And he said, okay, for, for this season, you just go, and whatever the saints give you, that's what it's going to be, all right? Just receive it in the spirit that is given, okay? I'll handle it if it's, if it's not right. Right now, I'm teaching you. See, one of the things that happens is sometimes God will have you in the beginning seasons of your ministry not allowing you to receive anything because he's doing a motive check. He's doing a motive purge. He's, he's, he's doing motive development, okay? He's making sure that you're in this thing for the right reason. There's too many preachers that are running around here, okay? They're only in it for the money, okay? And let me explain something to you. There's really no amount of money that can really... Hey, Pastor Tay, Pastor Goyles! There's really no, no amount of more money that can really adequately compensate you for the work of the ministry if you're doing it right, if you are actually in an authentic call of God. Oh, let's get that straight, okay? Um, even at preachers that we look at and we think that we're this successful, I can promise you something. The devils and the demons that they are fighting, there's no amount of money that can compensate for that, all right? And and and, and whatever you do, as you, as you are looking at honorariums or whatever, uh, don't allow yourself to get into the comparison trap of looking at what other preachers are dealing with because you have no idea of the devils that they have to fight. You, you are clueless as to what they have to I promise you, okay, if you see a preacher who has great, vis great visibility, who's well-known, who travels a lot, you would not want to deal with what that man or woman is dealing with, okay? So just get that in the mind. God, where do you have me, okay? When you know where God has you, that's your beginning foundational basis for beginning to understand where honorariums is. And where God has you is an ongoing check-in, is an ongoing check-in. This is why your prayer life is so important, okay? Conversating with God daily, talking with him, okay? And then as you're developing and as you're studying, as you're praying, as you're perfecting your craft, little by little, God will begin to bring you into a season where now you can receive honorariums. And one of two things is going to happen. I'm still talking about ministerial etiquette where, where honorariums is, con is concerned. God will either begin to put you on a gradual process, okay, of beginning to show you how to build an honorarium into your ministry, 
or there will be a turning point experience, okay? Um, amen. There will be a turning point experience where God will say, okay, that's it. Now you are released to receive an honorarium, to require an honorarium, and this is what it's going to be, and this is how you're going to go about it. That's very, very important. See, if you don't know where God has you, then you can't deal and operate properly with other people. And that, and you know, let me tell you something. That's a principle that goes beyond what we're talking about the topic today, okay? If you don't know where God has you, then you're not going to be able to deal appropriately and properly with other people, no matter where you are, no matter what you're dealing with, okay? Okay, you got to know where God has you, okay? Now, I gave you all um, the, the, the example of what happened to me in October. Okay, I'm preaching... Now I'm 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 in in the ministry of the word over 25 years. I've been preaching. A pastor 16 years. Okay, I would think if anybody disagrees with me, okay, but I would think at this particular point in time that I should get an offering greater than $50. Okay, when I go to minister, okay? Would, would, would anybody agree with that? Anybody would anybody agree with that? Do you think that this particular point in time with all the things that I've laid out to you, you would think that I should get an offering a little bit better than $50, okay? Everybody agree? Okay, cool. So, what God said to me when this thing happened in October, and if you didn't catch what I said in October, just please do the replay. He said, um, from now on, you have to require an honorarium. Okay, you have to require an honorarium. Let me take you back. I said there will be a defining experience um, where God will say, okay, that's it, time is up. And as a, I'll never forget as a minister of music when it happened. I had played for a revival. I'm thinking like $1,000. Oh, oh my God, Pastor. Thank you, sir, very much. He didn't tell me that. But, well, he, he gave me a minimum. But I, I, I receive it in Jesus' name. And see, see right there. See, there's got to be some humility. See, ministerial etiquette where Honor Rams is concerned, there's got to be some humility. Because the man of God said, I would think $1,000. And God didn't say that, but I received that, okay? And I got to find the balance. Now, if God says to me, you know, okay, you can do such and such. I'll tell you what he told me in a minute. I'll tell you what he told me in a minute, okay? But as a minister of music, I played for a revival, and, and I'm cutting I'm cutting through this. As a matter of fact, I tell the story in my book that I wrote, uh, um, To Be a Minstrel, a biblically-based perspective of, of, the, of the church musician. Uh, you know, I tell the story about what happened to me when I played for this revival, okay? Um, so if you want to get the book, go to Amazon and get it, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so um, I, was, I, I was mistreated with this revival, okay? I was mistreated with Biden. His his granddaughter, okay. His Ja, okay. Hey, hey, look at her. Look at that pretty girl. Hello, Scopey. Amen. Praise God. Bless you. I <laughs> heard him talking. Okay. So when God dealt with that, he said, That is not the scope of our relationship. That is not how I feel about you. You are not to be abused anymore. And from this point forward, you are never to do music ministry for less than this amount. Okay? All right, so now I come back and, and see things as we're walking with God are cyclical. Things are cyclical. Remember this. Life is, a, is the principle of rehearsal. Where you are now, you're rehearsing for where you're going to be later, okay? You're doing some things right now where you're rehearsing for where you're going to be later. If you don't believe it, go to Exodus, the third chapter, and watch how Moses practiced delivering the Israelites, okay? He was on the backside of the desert. God said, throw down that rod. He threw it down, it became a snake. Pick it back up again, it became a rod. Stick your hand in your bosom, okay? Pull it out, it was leprous. Put it back in, it was healed. He was practicing for when he was going to go before Pharaoh, okay? And life is practice. Here, here we go. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let, every, let everything be established. David was practicing going before the giant before he went to him. How was he practicing, okay? He was practicing with the predators that he was protecting the sheep from, okay? Where you are now, you're practicing for where you're going to be later, okay? So I had had practice as a minister of music. I had practice as a minister of music. So now here I come, and I'm at October, and this thing happens. And God says, from now on, you are to set an honorarium minimal, and you are not to go and minister for less than this amount, okay? Now, the amount that he told me was $500, okay? I don't have any qualm, any shame about saying it. Some of you may think it's more or whatever, okay? But he said minimally, no, no less than $500, all right? And what happens is, now he said, I want you to put a package in place. And by the way, the way he downloaded all this to me was through my spiritual father. Because I was so distraught about what had happened. I'm going to tell you all of God's honest truth. It had me messed up for a week. 
had me messed up for one solid week. I could not get past it. It had disturbed and it had rocked my spirit. And I was dealing with so many things. And again, thank God for the woman of God that he has given me in the person of my wife. She said, listen, honey, this does not reflect who you are in God. This not this not reflect your 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 your, your conscientiousness, conscientiousness. You did a great job. You you do what you're supposed to do. You prepare your stuff. You lay before the Lord. This does not reflect your work ethic. You did what you're supposed to do. Don't let this. I know you can, Pastor. I know you can, Pastor Boyles. Don't let this get in your heart. And she was ministering to me. But when I spoke to my spiritual father, See, this is why fathers are so important in the natural and in the spiritual, okay? This is why they're so important. They bring balance. They bring covering. They, you know, they, they, bring, they bring healing. They, they just bring so many things to us back to the table. When I spoke to my spiritual father, he said, listen, put together a package, okay? And when people inquire about you coming to minister, you let them know this is the package that I have, have all the requirements that's in it, okay, and make sure that they meet the minimal requirements before you agree to go and minister. He said, because you're past the point, okay, of being taken advantage of like this, all right? So you got to know where God is. That's where God has me, okay? I'm at this point now where he has said you are not to go out for less than. Now, he may make some exceptions, okay, but the rule of thumb is this. Now, here's the etiquette portion, decent and in order. Yes, Kayla Leon, here's the etiquette portion, okay? You, when someone asks you to come and minister, all right, you want to be very, very careful with coming out of the gate. Well, this is what I require, okay? This is what I require. You got to be very, very careful with that, all right? I understand why it is done, but there's a way to do it. And you want to ask the Lord to give you wisdom about how to do it, all right? You don't want to be offensive. You don't want to come across as arrogant. You don't want to come across as conceited you don't want to come across as not narcissistic and you definitely don't want to come across as a hireling as an individual who's only concerned about the money so when someone inquires asks you about coming you want to find out everything it is that they want you to do and you'll be engaged in so many different ways okay you may get a letter you may get an email you may get a phone call okay you may get a pigeon i don't know okay <laughs> you, you may get a fax or whatever you want to be as thorough as you possibly can and allowing the individuals to completely and fully express what it is that they want, okay? Telegraph, somebody said telegraph, Morse code, amen, all right? But at the same time, God has blessed you and you are bringing some to the table. Ble amen, thank God, praise God, to God be the glory, all right? You want to give the person an opportunity to express what it, what it is that they are looking for to have you come and do, all right? You don't want to be presumptuous, okay? You don't want to jump the gun, you know, because sometimes, you know, people, for instance, you, you have a church administrator and they've been given a set of instructions. You have, to be, you have to be careful how you deal with that because they're doing what they've been told to do, all right? Okay, for the most part, you have some that are on a power trip and, and, they, and they may take matters in their own hands. And if you're prayerful, God will allow you to discern that. But you want to be polite, you want to be courteous, you want to be godly, and you want to see, first of all, what it is that they have to say, all right? Then you want to line that up with where you are. Now, if God has not released you to deal with honorariums, then you receive the assignment, as long as the Lord is saying to do so, and as long as they're not asking, yes, cousin, respectful, as long as they're not asking you to do anything ungodly, okay? But if God has you at a place, once you, hey, darling, if God has you a place where he's released you, for a certain honorarium, once you hear everything they have to say, and if they have not covered that base, you can say to them respectfully, I am, I'm at a place where um, I receive an honorarium for the ministry work that I do. Just leave it right there, okay? And then see what happens, okay? Sometimes it's not necessary for you to pull the amount out right off the bat. You need to give them a chance. Sometimes people are preoccupied, and that's on their heart. They just haven't gotten to it. Sometimes people don't know that. This is brand new to them. They're operating in a new level of ministry that they've never gone in before, and they're learning too, and you don't want to be offensive, okay? Once they've said what they have to say, okay, you let them know. Well, I require an honorarium, and this is what I receive to minister, okay? Now, some individuals are going to be fine with it, okay? Some individuals may say, oh, I'm so sorry. We should have asked you that before we finished what we had to say. Some individuals, it may have to be a teaching moment. Believe it or not, in the body of Christ, there are still people who do not understand why 
someone should be compensated for ministry. That's just a reality, people. I'm not disparaging anybody. I'm not casting a negative a negative dis aspersion on anyone. That's just reality. Just They're just people in the body of Christ who still do not get it. And you need to take them through, okay, intelligently, in the spirit of godliness, why you receive an honorarium. And the best way to deal with it is start off with the scriptures, okay? So I gave you scriptures at the beginning of this, of this, of this, of this scope about that shows, you know, why we ought to receive honorariums, okay? What you need to do if you're a minister on this scope and you're, and you're, this is something that you're wrestling with about ministerial etiquette as far as honorariums is concerned. You need to go through the scriptures and acquaint yourself with what God has to say about His servants being compensated. And the Bible is rich. The Bible is rich with it. Okay. Also. You want to be as well versed as you can about the subject, so get yourself some good extra biblical resources about it. Okay, Google and do some research, ministerial honorariums, and see what comes up, and see who has written books about it. Okay, and then prayerfully ask the Lord which book you should purchase so that you can get some additional information about honorariums. You want to be well-versed about this because, see, you never know where God is going to take you. You may be the pastor one day who's now inviting someone to come in, and you want to operate and conduct yourself appropriately so you treat that servant of God the way they're supposed to be treated, okay? Now, forms of payment. Uh, wow, that's a biggie, man, because the day and age that we live in, because of technology and the changing economy and the things that's coming <laughs> And in, 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 in the economy of this world, that's changing, okay? Form, forms of payment. There's so many different ways to deal with it, okay? Um, obviously, you want to be sure that whatever you, whatever payment you're receiving is rubber-proof, okay? Let me, I'm just, folks, can I just be real? Can I just be straight with you? Okay. You want it to be rubber-proof, all right? Um, and this is going to be one of those areas, some, there's going to be some trial and error. Because there's some ministries that's going to give you the impression that they got their stuff together and they don't. And you won't find out until you try to go in and convert the form of payment of whatever it, or whatever it is that they've given you, okay? You'll learn how the rhythm of your ministry goes where this is concerned, all right? Um, go with the flow as far as what the ministry is doing. Go with the flow. Try and work with them, okay? Be gentle. Be polite. Be courteous, all right? You don't want to come out of the block, okay? Especially if nobody knows who you are, okay? Um, and, and you don't want to come across as someone arrogant and conceited or whatever, all right? You want to go with the flow, but at the same time, you want to find a balance to be sure that you are properly taken care of, okay? And if you have a preferred form of payment, there's nothing wrong with that, but be flexible. Be flexible. Now, the laws of the land that we deal with, okay, Cash payments are really not appropriate. Let's get that understood, okay? Cash payments are really not correct, all right? As far as the IRS is concerned, we're in the laws of the land, there's a certain way we're supposed to conduct ourselves. Cash payment is not appropriate, all right? Um, the IRS likes for monies to be documented and to be tracked, and as a minister of the gospel, you want to make sure that your reputation is upheld, okay? And so... Forms of payment to protect yourself, but to also protect that ministry should be in some type of documented form. Whether it, whether if it, whether it's a check, if it's a quick pay, then you have electronic trail to be able to show it came forward. Okay, um, something documented, something hard, something hard. That's how you want to receive your payments. And you know what? If they want to give you cash, then make sure you give them a receipt. Okay with your signature on it, all right? Um, if they say ahead of time, okay, we want to pay you cash, then draw up an envoice, okay, draw up an envoice. You, you can go on Google and Google envoice, how to make your own envoices. It's very easy. Draw up, uh, PayPal is good too. Yes, Kayla Leon, thank you. Thank you, okay? Draw up an envoice, do PayPal, all right? And keep printed records. And then let that be your form of, of payment. Let them understand, okay, this is how I receive payment. Because you want them to see, okay, I'm going to do things above board. I'm going to operate with integrity. Uh-oh. I'm going to operate with integrity. You don't want yourself damaged. You want to protect yourself. But you also want to protect that ministry, all right? Um, W-9s. W-9s. Okay. Now, the rule of thumb for W-9s is that when a person is coming in to do work in the ministry, 
when a person's coming to do work in the ministry, um, they're treated as an independent contractor. The rule of thumb is if they're receiving six hundred dollars or more, then there should be a, a W nine filled out. But what I do is I go take it a step beyond and I give a W nine anyway because I understand how important church records are, and I'm not trying to damage that church. I'm not trying to cause problems for that church. I'm trying to protect that church because I'm a kingdom-minded minded minister. It's not just about me and my local church, okay, but it's about the kingdom. It's about doing things that's going to protect and help my brothers and sisters, all right? So your W-9, you want to be prepared to deal with that. Church asks you to do W-9, don't fight with them. That's out of order. That's poor etiquette, okay? They're asking you to do it for a reason. And if a church has the presence of mind to ask you to fill out a, a W-9, not always, but for the most part, that tells you something about that church. That tells you that they're endeavoring to operate on a certain level and they're looking to do things the right way. At the very least, they are trying, okay? Now, your honorarium comes with so many different things attached to it, all right? It comes with so many things. Log in your payments before you spend the money. Uh-oh, okay, come on, Kayla Leon. Your honorarium comes with it. And once you start requiring honorariums, that means you have to conduct yourself at a certain level. You can't be sloppy, okay? You have to operate in excellence. You have to operate in excellence. So you have to have everything in order. If they ask you for certain paperwork, be prepared to supply the paperwork. If they ask you for a bio, if they ask you for a picture, be prepared to, to, to present it. You know, operate on a level of excellence and be prepared, okay? Some places you go, all right, they want to know, well, what are you going to be preaching? Be prepared to give them an outline. Some of them may go so far as to ask you for the sermon, okay? You got to know ahead of time that you're ready to deal with that, okay? Sometimes this is what happens in the level of what you're dealing with honorariums. And etiquette says that you respond to that uh, positively, okay? If you're uncomfortable with it, then let them know up front, okay? And then be prepared for the consequences because there's some places they don't want you to come if you don't want to supply a bio, a picture, you know, your outline ahead of time, especially if you're asking for an honorarium, all right? This is all part of ministerial etiquette. All right, now, how do I deal with, um, this is very informative, okay, how do you feel about those who do not request an honorarium but want a percentage of the offering? Oh, Reverend John, here you go, starting trouble. <laughs> okay, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Okay, um, I'm going to get to that. I was actually going to cover it. I was going to cover it, but I was hoping the Lord was going to let me off the hook. So by virtue of the fact you brought it up, I'm not off the hook. Okay. I'm going to get to that. Um, before I get to that, how is there a way to deal with the notion of honorarium when it doesn't go the way it's supposed to? Okay? Yes, there is a way to deal with it. Okay? Now, I covered it a little bit when I talked about what happened to me. All right? But then you may be in a situation where you're handed the check and you look at the check right on the spot while the pastor's there and it's not acceptable. At that moment, you have to pray. Before you do and say anything, you have to pray. Okay? Now, everybody's not going to agree with this. 90% of preachers aren't worth honorariums. <gasps> oh, my God. Oh, God. How you doing, Brother Tim? Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Wow. The saints of God is about to go in. Okay, that's a whole nother scope. I don't even know if I want to touch that one. My God, my God. Okay. Um... Oh, God. It's true, though, John. Okay, John. Oh, see, these are the heavy hitters that's, that's weighing in. These are the heavy hitters that's weighing in, okay? All right. You want to pray. Whenever you go in a situation and the honorarium is right, it's not right, first, pray, okay? Don't react. Respond, okay? Don't react. Respond, okay? First, pray. And then whatever the Lord tells you, you go that direction. I gave you my example, okay? First of all, I very rarely look at honorariums on the spot, okay? Why? Because it's just a personal conviction I have. It's the way I keep me from getting caught up in money. Why should I give you a check to preach on my platform and you don't draw nobody? <laughs> God! Woo! But see, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, Brother Tim. See, that's on me 
as the person inviting, because what I should have done is my due diligence in seeking God and praying as to whether or not I should have you there in the first place. That's how I approach it. And if I do what God tells me to do, then those other issues are going to work themselves out. Okay, that's what I do, just to answer that. Okay, um, but I also see your point, which is very well taken. All right, so God keeps me grounded by not letting me deal with money on the spot. Okay, but that's how he deals with me. But he may not, he may not deal with you that way. Okay, so if you're the kind of individual, because of some things that have happened to you, because of some experiences, or you may be in full-time ministry and you may be budgeting, okay? And you may be counting on certain things. And so you look at your envelope right in the spot. And I don't have a problem with that. I got to tell you straight up, I don't have a problem with that, all right? But if it's not the way it's supposed to be, okay, there's a proper way to deal with it. And you start first by praying. And now if you don't have a prayer life, this is not the time to develop one, okay? I'm sorry, that may be hard, that may be cold, that may be brutal, but it is the God's honest truth, okay? You want to have a prayer life before you get into these places. This is why sometimes in the backside of you, uh, uh, and, and, and when you're in the backside of your desert experience, you're being given the opportunity to develop these things so that when you get in the trenches, you're not looking for stuff you should already have. All right. So you get this check and it's not right. You pray. Okay. And whatever God tells you to deal with, you ask him to give you the wisdom to deal with it appropriately. If he says, okay, deal with this, say, okay, okay, God, how should I? And one of the things you always want to do is you always want to preserve relationship as much as you can. The Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no one shall see the, see the Lord. And we always want to be at peace, okay? We always want to main, re, maintain relationship. We always want to keep the harmony as much as we can. I know you can't do it, everybody. I understand that. But you want to be sure you're the one that's working at doing it, okay? You want to be sure you're the one. And you explain to the pastor, you know, and, and you make sure you do it in a, in, 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 a, in a tone that's not threatening, that's not confrontational, okay? Because you can confront without being confrontational, okay? That's, a, that's, a, just, that's just a, a side note, download nugget, okay? You can confront without being conf confrontational. And you can say it in a spirit of humility, okay, with firmness. And you can say, you know, Pastor, um, thank you for what you have given me, but I was expecting a little bit more. And then be prepared to say why, okay? Then, after that, you know, use the sandwich approach as well, okay? Use the sandwich approach. The sandwich approach is a compliment, then the critique, then the compliment. The compliment, then the critique, then the compliment, okay? So you start out with, okay, you know what? I enjoyed the time I had here. Thank you for what you did. Maybe they did something. Maybe the glass of water was good. Okay, compliment something. Find something to compliment, okay? Um, amen, Pastor Alicia, thank God. Okay, then say, but however, my expectation was something different. And then be prepared to say why that is the case, all right? And then close with the compliment. And then also be ready to deal with the consequences thereof. One of the things that God is not pleased with is the people of God fighting about money. Okay, everybody's not going to agree with that. That's fine, okay? My conviction is God is not pleased when we fight about and fight over money. God is not pleased with that, okay? That is not what this is about. Um, and you want to maintain the peace. And then once you get that out there, whatever the consequences are, okay, if you can't live with them, then just, just wipe your hands of it, shake the dust up your feet, and then prepare to make adjustments accordingly after that, okay? More than likely, you can't go back there. Or if you're invited, Back again, if they ask you to come back, make it very clear. Well, you know, the way things went down last time as far as the business is concerned, it just wasn't right. I'm not comfortable with it. I'm going to need things to go a little bit differently in order for me to return. I thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Because you don't want to be arrogant. You don't want to be abrasive. You don't want to be combative. You want to be firm. And that's how you deal with that. Okay, now, Reverend John, you still with me? I hope you're still with me because you started this. Okay, so I, you're going to need to be in on this one with me. All right, come on, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, man of God. Let me know you're still with me, all right? Because he asked a whopper, okay? He asked a whopper. You still there? Reverend John Montplacier, are you still there? <laughs> he, he dropped a bomb and then, and, then got, and then got away. Okay, maybe he lost connection because I know sometimes he, he has connection problems. Okay, so he's probably going to catch the replay. He said, 
what do you do about percentages? And I really wish he was on here so I can so I can make sure I ask it properly. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, there's a practice in the body of Christ where um, a preacher comes in, he's invited or she's invited to come in, and there's an arrangement made that the offering that's given, they will receive a percentage of the offering. They will split it with the church. Um, usually, my experience has been, I haven't heard any different, my experience has been that the guest preacher that's coming in is actually the one that receives or raises the offering, okay, and then um, they get a percentage of what's raised. All right. Um, without stepping on any toes, um, how do you know the amount that was raised? Well, I, um, the trace, <laughs> it means um, that there's, oh, God, this is this is sticky. This is so sticky. Okay. Um, it means at some particular point, um, I'm going to deal with that ethical in a minute. I'm going to deal with that. If the preacher is raising the offering, more than likely he or she is keeping a running mental tab of how people are responding. Okay, and they're getting an idea of what's coming in. They usually have a person with them to help count. Okay, that may be one way they're doing it as well. But I'm talking about what I've been exposed to when they're raising the offering. They're usually keeping a count. All right. Um, God help me, John. Where are you, John Montplacier? Okay. Let me let me respond to this from my personal convictions. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Holy Ghost. When Paul is teaching in Corinthians, he says. I say this, you know, not as a word from the Lord, but of myself. Okay, I'm going to borrow from the Apostle Paul. Um, and let me let me preface my my outlook on that by saying this: When God brought me into the ministry of the Word, He said to me very clearly, He said, "I've called you to be a preacher and not a fundraiser. You are never to raise offerings when you go out to minister." said, you are a preacher and not a fundraiser. You are never to raise offerings when you go out to minister. He said, you trust me to pay you. You trust me to pay you, okay? You trust me. And this is before I set the honorarium deal. And even now with the honorarium deal, I will not raise an offering, okay? And what happens is, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go over this with you all, but let me insert this. When a pastor says to me, well, I can't afford this, then what happens is at that point, I say, well, you know what? Then we're going to have to table this and wait until you can. Or I'll say, okay, don't worry about it. Let's trust God. Okay? That's what I'll do. Um, sometimes God will say to me, you just go and don't worry about it. I'll pay you. All right? But my conviction is that I'm not called to be a fundraiser. I'm called to be a preacher. All right? And I believe the ethics of doing that creates a conflict of interest. Okay, a conflict of interest. So that now, if you're a full-time evangelist, if you're a full-time preacher, okay, and this is your income, you could be very well tempted to do some things that God has nothing to do, that's, that, that's coming from your flesh, that you're being driven by a motive, money motive because you're trying to meet some kind of bottom line. You're trying to meet some budget. You're trying to meet some bill. And that's why my personal conviction is that it, someone said ethical that is not ethical and I don't believe that it should happen in the house of God that's me saints that's me okay it's my personal conviction um, let me go let me go a step further in the church that I pastor it does not happen okay now the Bible says as we purpose in our hearts I believe it's second Corinthians 9 and 7 uh, let's go there because we, we're supposed to be dealing with scriptures that's how relationships get terminated. Oh, my God. Okay. Second, let me see this. Second Corinthians 9 and 7. Let me see if this is here. Um, uh, okay, yes. Check this out. Second Corinthians 9 and 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Okay. So sometimes when we're doing the percentage deal, okay, more often than not, the operation of the gifts of the Spirit is associated with that in some way, shape, or form. 
and usually, not always, but in most of the times I've seen it, an individual is ministering in the gifts of the Spirit as they're ministering to people, okay? 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. So that they have individuals come forward as they prophesy to them, give them a word of knowledge, give them a word of exhortation. And the premise has been that they're coming bringing a certain offering, okay? When we look at this verse of Scripture, let me also take you to Exodus, Exodus 25 and, and 1. Exodus 25 and 1. Um, my program started, all of a sudden started acting uh, inappropriately. Let's go, here we go, we're back. Okay, go to Exodus, Exodus 25 and 1. Okay, because I, I want you to see this in the Word. Okay, chapter 9, verses 7. Okay, oh, hey, Vicky, I didn't know you came on. Okay, Exodus 25, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to bring me their sacred offerings, accept the contributions from all whose hearts are moved to offer them. Okay, now, as a pastor in the church that I pastored in, okay, I receive the offering, but that's different because that's part of my responsibility to 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 ask and to receive. Okay, but at the church that I pastor, okay, it's understood. Whenever a guest comes in, he or she understand. You do not raise the offering. As a matter of fact, it's in our church's bylaws and constitu constitution that no one outside the church is allowed to raise an offering during our church encounters. We call our services encounters. Okay. No one outside the church is allowed to raise money. Okay? No one. So not only is that a standard that I use when I go outside the house, that is a standard that I use for inside the house. Okay? And the elders at our church have been taught. Hey, Cousin Sean! The elders at our church have been taught that if for some reason I'm not there and there's a guest and he or she begins to raise an offering, you are, go, you are to go and get the mic and tell them, Okay, thank you. You are finished now. Okay? They've been told. And they've also been told, if it goes down and you don't do that, then you're going to have to answer to me when I get back. Okay? That's just how strong my convictions are about that. Okay? There's just, there's just too much of a temptation when we do it that way. At, I mean, just at the very least, okay? There's just too much of a temptation to not be objective, to not be pure, to not hear unconditionally from God to see what it is that he wants to do. There's too much of a temptation for you to insert yourself in there because now you're looking at other things and you're being motivated by something else. Shut it down or get shut down. Amen. All right? And I just, I'm not in agreement with that. Okay? Um, and Reverend John mentioned that. All right? So what about the money that people lay on the altar while someone is preaching? <laughs> oh, God. Y'all ain't, ain't going to let me go with this. Okay. Jesus. Jesus, my God. Okay. Let me let me respond to that first by saying this. Does that go to the church or to the preacher? That I don't know. That, Latrice, I don't know. Okay. Um, let me respond to that by saying some things that happen in the church with regards, uh, yeah, people do that. Yes, Kelly Leon, people do that. Okay. Some things that happen in the church, you know, they start out with a good, healthy premise. But sometimes things go awry and they get lost in the translation, all right? They go awry and they get lost in the translation. Um, some churches do that because the teaching is at the moment um, something is said to you that blesses your heart, that blesses your spirit, that ministers to you, that you receive the return on that by investing in that, by giving into it. And some people are taught respond to that at that moment and give right then, Okay. And so that's why some of them, you'll see, if you've ever watched certain television shows, you've watched certain preach preachers or whatever, that's why you see people running up to the altar and bringing an offering while the man of God is preaching because they've been taught to respond to that revelation if it has affected them a certain way and to sow into that revelation by completing, by completing okay? And, and the premise is what I said to you before, if, if we've sown to you spiritual things, then we should reap your natural things, okay? That's where that comes from, all right? Certainly pure. Certainly well-meaning. The problem I have with it on a personal level is I think it's a distraction. Okay? It happens often. You may not even realize you have seen it. Okay. I think it's a distraction, number one. And um, I think it takes away from the entirety of the moment of what's going on. Because now you got people running up, 
bringing um, the offering. And you got some people who are more caught up in the person bringing the offering, okay, than hearing to what the man of God is saying. Uh, because you could be running up that moment and you're responding to something that hit, hit you, but now you're detracting as you're distracting from what the man of God is saying that could be blessing somebody else, okay? I mean, to me, it just seems to be just great common sense, okay? Yeah, and it has the potential, Kayla Leon, to become just that, chaotic. At our church, we, we just don't let that go down, okay? If, if something strikes you, then make a note of it, okay? And then when it's time to give, ask the Holy Spirit how you are to respond to it at the time of, give, of giving. Yes, just wait, just wait to the end. As a matter of fact, in our worship encounters, we have what's known as the last act of worship. And that is when the offering is taken. It's the very last thing that we do. We give as we are leaving. Because we don't want, we never want our church to become about money. We never want our ministry to become about money. Now, money is essential, okay? You can't do ministry without money. Let's make that very, very clear, okay? It costs to do ministry. And that's another reason why an honorarium is appropriate. Because it's going to cost you something. You know, your clothes are going to have to be clean. You're going to need a haircut. Ladies, you're going to need your hair did. Okay, uh, you're going to need to be clean. Okay, you, you, you need to have access to soap and water. All right. Um, <laughs> so it costs you. It costs you. And that's why an honorarium is appropriate. Okay, because your, your Bible is going to cost you. Okay, the paper you use for your manuscript, whether it's actual paper or electronic, the computer, the tablet is going to cost you, whether or not you use the phone. Okay, it's going to cost you. The transportation expense is going to cost you. Okay. Um, the gas is going to cost. If you're traveling afar, the traveling expense is going to cost. If you need to stay overnight, it's going to cost, okay? And some churches don't have the presence of mind when they invite you some someplace to do that, to build that in. So you got you to gotta take care of that yourself. And again, the Bible says, who goes to warfare at his own expenses? I gave you the scripture passage, okay? So, you know, we have it at the end because we don't want the word of God to be distracted from, okay? We don't want people's attention caught up in all these other things. We want them to be zeroed in on what the Lord is saying. So that's why yeah, the offerings at the altar deal, yeah, that's a little questionable. And, I, and I'm being very delicate about addressing it because I don't want to cast a negative aspersion on anyone's ministry, on what someone else's church does, because you know there's some churches that really have a well-meaning reason behind why they do it. Um, I personally don't. Pre I personally prefer that it's not done while I'm ministering. Okay, okay. And if it's a part of the honorarium system that you you, you I, but suppose you go to a church, and and that's part of how they do things. How should I handle it, Pastor? And I asked the Lord one day I, as I was watching TV, and I said, God, if you allow me to go to a church where they do that, how should I handle that? Please don't forget. How do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Yes. Okay. I'm going to deal with Kelly Leon. Okay. I said, God, how, how do I handle that? Because at the same time, okay, I don't want to disrespect that house. I don't want to do and say anything contrary to the way that house has been taught. Okay? What do I do about that? And this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. This is the wisdom he gave me. He said, if you're ever in a situation and that happen, say to the house, I appreciate you all have been trained to do this. Okay? But so that I'm not distracted. And I can focus on what God is doing. May I kindly ask you to bring your honorarium up to a place on the altar where I won't be so easily distracted and I can stay focused on ministering the word of God to the people. You can follow through with the protocol you've been given, but please do, do so to this side so that I can maintain my focus and keep my intention so I can do what I need to do as far as the assignment that God has given to me for you. And that's the way God taught me, taught, taught me how to do it, okay? See, see, there's always a place for wisdom, okay? And there's always a place to get the download of the mind of God. And the more you anticipate it ahead of time, the better off you're going to be. All right, listen. Um, there's so many different aspects of, con of covering honorarium and ministerial etiquette. Because there's so many different ways churches operate and there's so many different things that go on. Prayerfully, I have given you something to stimulate you 
to 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 now go in a direction to seek God about what He wants to do for your ministry. Okay, let me close with this: Never compromise your relationship with God for money. Never compromise your relationship with God for money. Do not allow yourself to get in anything and to go in anywhere where you have to compromise your relationship with God because of money. All right. If you go, if if you are invited to an assignment, okay, and you're uncomfortable with the way they do things as far as money is concerned, but God has made it clear to you that you are to accept this assignment, then if God gives you the clearance, you can say to them, you know what, let's not worry about an honorarium. Let me just come and minister the word of God. Okay? I've done it. What do you think about a pastor with 10 edges? Oh, Kyle. <laughs> oh, Kyle. That's another, that's another scope, Kyle. That's another scope. That's another scope, okay? That's a whole nother scope. Oh, my God. That's my cousin, y'all. That's my cousin. Um, Oh, Jesus. Okay. Lord, help me. Okay. I got, uh, Kyle, I got one. And that's Pastor Pat, my wife, okay? She's my adjutant, whatever that is, all right? Um, so I'm going to leave that right there, okay? Whatever you do, don't compromise for money. Don't compromise for money. Don't compromise for money, okay? Always, no matter what, maintain the relationship that you have with God. Don't sell out your relationship with God. At the end of the day, you want to be sure that the line stays clear between you and God. That there's nothing that separates you and God. Isaiah said, your sins have separated you from God so that he does not hear you. Okay? Never allow money and compensation to interfere. Never allow it to interfere with your relationship with God. And walk away from it. Refuse to become a part of it. Refuse to... excuse me, refuse to partake of it. It's better for you to say, you know what, let me just give you what God has given to me and let him pay me than for you to get wrapped up. Because I've seen a lot of ministers, there's something about when they start down this very dark road of not properly handling uh, properly handling, handling honorariums, very few of them make it back to a place of soundness, to a place of wholeness, to a place of rightness, to a place of being ethical, to a place of morality, and to a place of godliness. Very few of them. It's, 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 it's like, it's almost like a, a spiritual crack cocaine that they just get addicted to and they can't deliver from, get, and can't get delivered from. You don't want to start that road, okay? You don't want to start down that road. Keep your heart pure. Keep it honest. Yes, honorariums are appropriate, okay? But there's a way to deal with it. And let God give you the wisdom behind how to approach it. Don't be inflexible. Okay, let me tell you that. Let me, let me say that to you also again. Don't be inflexible. Don't be, you know, a person that says, well, no matter what, I got to get this. Okay, no, you, you can't be like that. That's improper etiquette. That's improper etiquette. Okay, spiritual gifts. Kayla Leon, spiritual gifts. She asked me about this. So let me, let me, let me tackle this um, um, in, in a way that I can. Um, first of all, Let's understand that every believer has a spiritual gift, okay? 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. As a matter of fact, if you want to understand about spiritual gifts, you read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. You must read those three chapters, okay, together to understand spiritual gifts. It, and they are foundational. There are other passages of Scripture that talk about spiritual gifts, okay? But those are foundational um, for us getting the proper understanding about them individually and collectively, okay? All right. So then once you understand every believer has a spiritual gift, now what you have to do is you have to acquaint yourself with what they are, okay? Yes, 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. All three chapters, okay? Read all three chapters. Study all three tra chapters. Thank you, Pastor. I'll catch the rest of the replay. God bless you. Okay, okay, Latrice, bless you. Okay? Um, study all three chapters because all three chapters deal with spiritual gifts, okay? They deal with them individually and collectively, all right? And so the spiritual gifts that, you know, that we tend to focus on, but there's others mentioned throughout the scriptures, okay, but are the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And they are in three categories, okay? And these are the three categories of these nine gifts, okay? Gifts of the mind. This is the, I'm oversimplifying it, okay? Gifts, uh, gifts, gifts, gifts of how we think, gifts of, how, of, of what we say, 
and gifts of what we do, okay? Gifts of what we think, gifts of what we say, and gifts of what we do, okay? Um, those are the three gifts, okay? Gifts that's going to involve our minds, gifts that's going to involve our voices, what we say, and then gifts that's going to involve actions of what we do, all right? When you acquaint yourself with those gifts, okay, that gives you your basis, your foundation for beginning to understand spiritual gifts and now begin to, beginning to open up your heart and your mind and your spirit to what your gift could be, all right? As you're studying them, you're praying and you're asking God, show me my spiritual gift, okay? Also in your prayer time, your personal prayer time, you want to devote in your personal prayer time, okay, God, what is my spiritual gift, okay? And when you ask God something, he does answer. Now, he may not answer when you want him to, but he will answer, okay? And as you pray, as you pray for your studies, but as, as you pray for your prayer time, and as you are acquainting yourself and studying the gifts of the Spirit, also get extra biblical books about gifts of the Spirit, all right? One of the best books that, in my opinion, was ever written about spiritual gifts was by Dr. David Ireland called Activating the Gifts of the Spirit. It is one of the best extra biblical books you can get about spiritual gifts. You can get it. You should be able to get it from Amazon. Okay, he pastors Christ Church, and uh, there's actually two camp campuses: Montclair, New Jersey, and also Rockaway Township, New Jersey. Okay, it's one of the best books that was ever written about spiritual gifts, in my opinion. Okay, uh, very exhaustive, but also very practical and very succinct. Okay, so with the scriptures. And extra biblical books you want to start beginning to read and study and your prayer. Ask God what your gifts are. And then he will begin to unfold to you what your gifts are. He may tell you directly, your gift is this. Or he may begin to uh, bring you back to certain experiences. And he'll, and he'll take you through the panorama of your memory and start bringing to the forefront of your consciousness things that happen. Okay? And start showing you how all along in your development, all along in your experiences, you are being prepared for a particular gift of the Spirit, okay? Um, one of the gifts of the Spirit that I have is the gift of prophecy, okay? Um, the prophetic gift. God has given me the prophetic gift, okay? Um, and understand something, too. The Bible says gifts and callings come without repentance. So your possession of the gift doesn't mean that you're in the, in the right place that you're supposed to be in with God, okay? Psychics are perverted prophets. They've taken their prophetic gift and allowed it to be perverted for a filthy gain. Okay? Remember that. Okay? Um, would you say what you're passionate about may be indicative of what your spiritual gifts are? Yes. Pastor Alicia, yes. It is one of the starting points. And that's what I was saying. God will take you back and he will show you things and experiences and you will begin to see. Okay? Um, now, those nine gifts of the spirit are not the only spiritual gifts, but they're going to be foundational to let you begin to understand where your gift may fall. All right? Um and then as you begin to understand and see certain experiences and see common denominators through those experiences and know about the gifts, now you begin to see where your heart is being tuned to the possibility of, okay, this may be my gift. And then what will happen is God will show you now how to pay attention to experiences that happen throughout the course of your life on a regular basis that mirror that gift, okay? Okay, and once that happens, okay, and you start becoming aware of it, now you'll start seeing when God puts you in places for that gift to operate. Now, here's one of the things that's going to become evident to you. You're going to begin to realize that that gift was in operation all along. You just didn't know it. And now you are aware of it. You are attuned to it, okay? Um, and now you can be intentional about it, and now you can open up yourself more to the times that God wants to use it, to the times where you may have missed it because you were not aware of it, okay? So that's how you begin to discover your spiritual gifts, okay? Now, this is where being a, pa being a part of a, of, a, of, a, of a local church is so important because God exposes who we are in the company of our brothers and sisters, okay? He works on us through our brothers and sisters, okay? He works on us. He works through us. Okay, he works in us. He works for us through our brothers and sisters. And it's a safe environment, okay, because oftentimes it's trial and error. And if you make a mistake, okay, we're in the house of love. We're covering each other. We can learn from our mistakes. Yes, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm the worship leader at my church. Okay, okay. And that is also a gift. It's a calling. It's an office, but it's also a gift, all right? So um, your pastor oftentimes 
God will show them things about you. God will show them things about you, and they will put you through the leading of the Holy Spirit in places for the gifts, the gift of the gifts that's in you to begin to flourish and begin to develop, okay? Here's an example. Um, you know, God has given me the gift of music, you know, because he's called me to be a minister of music, okay? And, um, okay, Kyle, amen, amen, amen. That's a gifting as well. So um, my first music ministry assignment that I got, that I received from an employment standpoint of view, um, he, yes, he asked me. I wasn't thinking about it. Okay, okay, there you go. There you go. So the, ch the first church I went to work at as a minister of music, where I was in charge of the music ministry. It was my responsibility to, to build and to develop the, de the department, to teach the choir, the songs, or whatever. It was a young church. Ch church was brand new, 18 months old, all right? And um, the first choir that I had to develop was a youth choir, okay? And um, I taught this particular youth choir a song. And the pastor didn't like the song, okay? He did not like the song. And he said to me, he said, I don't like that song. I don't want them to sing... He actually identified the songwriter, and he said, I don't want them to sing that particular songwriter's songs anymore. He said, as a matter of fact, until further notice, I only want them to sing the songs that you write. Well, saints, at that point, I had only written one song, okay? Now, we got a problem, because there's 52 weeks in the year, okay? There's 52 Sundays in the year. We can't do that one song for 52 Sundays. The Bible says, sing unto the Lord a new song, okay? So we can't do the same song for 52 weeks. That's not going to work. So God, if I've only written one song, we got a problem, okay? There's 51 weeks missing. We got an issue. What are we going to do about this? And I was forced to get into a place to begin to pray and say, God, you got to help me. And do you not know, beloveds, I discovered that I had the gift to write songs. Okay? That's why being in a church, being underneath a pastor is so important. Because through them, God will show you things about you. Okay? And the pastor won't even know what they're doing. They're just receiving from God. Okay? God is just telling them, put them in this position. Put them in that place. And put them there. And put them, because a gift, a spiritual gift or gifts is coming out of you. Okay? Writing songs is a gift. It, it was for me. <laughs> it, it was for me. It was for me, Kayla Leon, okay? Nobody trained me, okay? I didn't go to songwriting school, okay? I just sat down and started hearing melodies. But what if they're intimidated by your gift? Oh, God, Pastor Alicia, here you go, daughter. Here you go, okay? Here we go, okay? Just, just give me a minute, okay? Um, <laughs> Lord, help me. Lord, help me. This is a long scope. We might have to do a part two on this, okay? Um... You know, I, I I didn't go to a school to learn. Hey, hey, Vicky, I didn't go to a school to learn this. Okay, it just came. I just started hearing melodies, and I started hearing lyrics, and I just sat down and just started playing them, and the Holy Spirit just started writing through me, and I just started putting stuff together. Okay, and it just started flowing. Once I put myself in the position to comply with what God wanted, then. The flow of the anointing was released, and it just happened, okay? This was 30, this was 30, oh my goodness. This was 30, how, how old was I when I went to play for him? Oh, Jesus. Um, this was 30 some odd years ago, and I'm still writing songs. I can't play, but I have words and a, mel and a melody, okay? Get some kind of recording device, Vicky, and sing what you hear into that recording device along with the words. And let that be your first starting point, okay? The Andre Crouch, the late Andre Crouch, he's gone on to be with the Lord, okay? He had he had a learning disability. He was dyslectic. He could not read music. He could not read music. And what he would do is God would download melodies and songs and words to him frequently, Okay? And he learned to get a tape recorder and put it by the side of his bed because God would wake him up in his sleep many a nights and give him a song. He would sing it into the tape recorder, and then he would get up the next morning and, and, and then work on the song. And that's how many of the songs that we still sing to this day was birthed through that man of God. Songwriting is a gift, okay? 
Now, some individuals go to school to learn how to do it, okay? But then there are some individuals that are just gifted to do it. I never, I was never, never went to nobody's school to learn how to write, okay? A song. God did it, and he still does it, and he's still doing it. So that's how you get your gifts. Kayla Leon, I hope I answered that question. Okay, I hope I answered that question. Okay, so Vicky, you tape them, okay? Once you tape them, keep working with them. Keep working with them because our gifts are perfected through practice. Our gifts are perfected through practice. Our gifts are perfected through practice. They're refined, they're polished. And we also go into deeper depths of, 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 of learning things about them and mastering them the more we work with them, okay? And, and pray, God, pray and ask God to show you the place that he's made, the platform, the arena that he's made for the expression of that gift, okay? It may be just, he's just giving you songs just for your personal worship time between you and him. It might very, very, well, be, it might very well be that, but ask God to show you that, okay? Um, um, and then just keep working that gift, keep working that, that craft. Okay, what do we do about people who are intimidated by a gift, okay? Uh, Pastor Alicia, <laughs> um, the only thing I can say at the moment about it, and I and I just need to m just pray about it a little bit more. Only thing I can say about it, the Bible says a man's gift, and it also implies a woman's gift, makes room for them and brings them before great people. Um, if you're in a circle, if you're in an atmosphere, if you're in an arena where people are intimidated for your gift, then more more than likely that is not the place for your gift. And what I would suggest to you is. You do two things. You continue working on that gift. You continue practicing that gift. But you also start praying and asking God to show you where he has made room for you in that gift. All right? And then prepare yourself to go to the place where he has made room. Because sometimes we're in a place where people are intimidated by a gift. And we're not supposed to be there. But we, for whatever reason, don't want to leave. We don't want to change. We don't want to move. Okay, um, and and change is a very difficult thing for human beings because of the uncertainty for it. Um, so that may very well be the issue. The other thing is, it may not be time yet for the release of that gift, and the intimidation factor may be an indication that time has not yet fully matured for that gift to be accepted and appreciated and valued and celebrated in that setting. So you may be dealing with that as well. I would say you have to pray. And ask God to show you what is going on. And be prepared to flow with whatever he's telling you. Alright? Does that answer your question, Pastor Alicia? Are you still with, are you still with us? Okay, great. Okay. I've been on this scope for over an hour and a half. I did not intend to be this long, saints of God. So, I think it's time for us to wrap up. Um... Pastor Vic Goodwood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we before we close, are there any more questions? Are we any are there any more questions? Any more comments? Um, amen. God bless you, Kelly Leon. I pray that this blesses you. As you're starting out, um, I pray that you don't have to experience some of the painful things that I experienced. Um, you're gonna go through some things in ministry that comes with the course. But if I can help you and help you avoid some of the pitfalls that I went through, then I'll be blessed by that. Hey, Cousin Kyle, bless you. God bless you too. What's your thought on preacher preaching his heart out, people deliver it, and give you $75? <laughs> uh, um, okay. All right. Two good, two, two good questions there. Um, Elder Calvin, um, I don't know. Did you did you catch the whole scope? Um did you catch the whole scope? Uh, somebody said dreams and visions. Okay, everybody was speaking tongues. Okay, you didn't catch the whole scope. Okay. Um, man of God, I dealt with this in the scope. Um, there's, just, to, just, just to recap, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to watch the scope. Just to recap, there's two sides to it. Okay? Um, I'll say what I said earlier. First and foremost, you want to make sure you guard your heart. Okay, you want to make sure you guard your heart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta watch, you gotta, you gotta watch this whole scope. They said they want you back. Yeah, watch this whole scope. Okay, you want to guard your heart and don't allow 
that experience to injure you to a point where it 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 corrupts you, it damages you beyond repair. That's the first thing. Okay. Uh, the second thing is, I had said earlier, know where God has you. Okay, know where God has you. And if you're at a place where God has told you, um, well, for now, don't worry about that, then that's what you go with, okay? But if you're beyond that, then you have to deal with that. And I talked about how to deal with that earlier in the scope. In my personal opinion, I don't think that's right, okay? That's my personal opinion, man of God. Um, just from a from a stamp a dollars and cents standpoint of view. Okay, let me just let me just introduce lab, principles of labor here, people. Let's just be principles. I am I wrong for saying I'm I'm getting national speaking tape. Um, no, please watch the please watch this scope. No, no, you're not, elder. Okay, um, no, you're not. However, there is a caveat to that, and I and I gave the caveat in the scope. Okay. Because you always want to follow what, what the Lord is leading, okay? Um, so, uh, I was about to say something. I lost my train of thought. Oh, God, I lost my train of thought. There was something I really wanted to say. Um, Lord, help me. Okay. Um, yeah, practical, dollars and cents, okay? Just labor principles. Okay, and I said this before, okay? If you do eight hours of work and somebody gives you $75, okay, that's not even $10 an hour. Do you think that's God? No, okay? There's so much work that goes into one sermon. There's so much work that goes into one sermon, okay? Those who teach homiletics, homiletics is the science of preparing and delivering a sermon. Those who teach homiletics Say, if you want to deliver a sound, good message homiletically, it takes at least 20 hours to prepare that message, okay? Well, let's do the math. $20, I mean, uh, 20 hours, $75? Come on, people. Do you think that you think that God is okay with that? Absolutely not, okay? So, to answer your question, just from a practical standpoint of view, no, it's not right. But... God does things in ministry for different reasons, and sometimes he allows that for whatever reason, and I talked about that in the scope. Okay. Um, somebody somebody asked about tongues. Okay. I don't know if you're still with us. Are you still with us? Um, talk to me and let me know. If, okay. Should, you know, t give me the question once again. Once again, I want to make sure I get it exactly and succinctly. Okay. Um, give me the question once again. Yeah, I know one person who should have gotten 25, never came prepared with a message. Okay. <laughs> you Now, you're talking like Tim, who was on, who was on. And see, that's a whole other thing, okay? And that's why I talked about earlier, knowing where you are. Knowing where you are. Yeah, you haven't done your homework. You you ought not to get nothing, okay? Okay, that's just, you you know, that's just basic. Kept saying God giving him something. Kept saying, okay, yeah, God wasn't giving him nothing, okay? Um, can any believer pray and receive the gift? Of speaking in tongues. Absolutely. Okay. A certain teenager wants to know when you're doing a teaching to go to. Oh, wait, wait. Say that again, Pastor Alicia. I missed that. Okay. Call me hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any believer who wants to receive it can receive it. And 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 let me put that 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 caveat on there, the emphasis on wants to. Okay? Because there's some believers who don't want the gift. Okay. But any believer who wants to receive it can receive it. Okay. Is there a circumstance where God might delay? Um, not necessarily where he delays, but where we cause the delay, okay? We cause the delay for a lot of reasons. Acts, the fifth chapter, the 32nd verse, cause B, says the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. Check that out, okay? And sometimes we can't receive the gift because there's things between us and the receiving of the gift. Okay, so the issue is not a God. Matter of fact, he made it available, okay? The day of Pentecost is here for every believer that wants it, okay? What you need to do is find out the place you need to be in to receive the gift. There may be some things on the line between you and God. The Holy Spirit is not going to dwell in an, un in an unclean vessel. Tongues, are you saying different languages or the spiritual language? Um, uh, 
I, I, I would say the spiritual language. Yes, the spiritual language, okay? Um, now, one of, the, one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, okay, is um, diverse tongues. And that speaks to the extra, uh, extraordinary manifestation of that gift where an individual receives a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit to speak in, in, in a variety of tongues. And often the interpretation of tongues goes along with that to be able to interpret those tongues. But every believer, on a basic level, is given a spiritual language, their own spiritual language, okay? Uh, Jude, the 20th chapter, the King James Version says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's a reference to praying in the Spirit. Paul talks about, I will pray in the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. First Corinthians, I believe it's the 7th chapter. Is it First Corinthians 7th chapter? Um, oh, no, the 14th chapter, excuse me. First uh, Corinthians, the 14th chapter, he talks about praying in the spirit and praying with the understanding, okay? Edifying yourself in tongues, okay? Read that, read that. Again, First Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 13th chapter, and the 14th chapter, okay? The gifts of the spirit is open to every believer who wants to receive it. If you have named the name of Jesus Christ, if you've asked him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, you repent of your sins, and you're making every effort that you can to walk with him, to take up your cross, to deny yourself, and to follow him, then yes, you are entitled to that gift. It is yours. And if you want it, go after it, okay? Um, Alicia, put that up again, okay? Put that up again. She wants to know when you're doing a teaching for church musicians, getting them together. <laughs> Did you show her the book? Okay, that's a whole nother thing. Okay, that's a whole nother thing. Lord Jesus. Um, tell her when I'm invited, I will do it. Tell her I, when I'm invited, I will do it. Okay, and somebody said, hurry, okay? And worship leaders too. Oh my God! When I'm invited, I guess I, I, I am I. Is that a hint for me to do a scope? Okay. I don't know if I can do that topic uh, justice on a scope, because I just have too much in me for over, from from over 35 years. Wait a minute. No, it's more than 35 years now. Uh, yeah, 37 years um, of just music ministry experience. So I can't do that. I can't do that justice with just a scope. Okay. Um, so. Um, so, so the book wasn't enough for her? <laughs> that no, oh, man, that Naomi is powerful, man. Ooh, she's powerful. Um, she's seen the book and read it low key. Oh, so she wants more. She's one of them greedy saints. Okay. Um, tell her to pray. Tell her to pray that the Lord will give me the proper platform to deal with it. And um, if he makes it so, I will go according to the leading of the Lord. Um, because that's another sore topic in the body of Christ. Oh, that's a very sore topic. My God. The, the, the ministry of music. Oh, my God. Is that so sore? That is so sore. Um, and you know what? I'm going to do a second ministerial etiquette honorarium for musicians, for ministers of music, for the ministry. Yes, I am. Watch. I'm going to let you know when that's coming. Okay. She says, I'm music. <laughs> She didn't. Okay. Lord, help us. Oh, I can't mess with her. I cannot mess with her. Okay, tell her. Oh, my God. Okay, we got to talk about that. We got to talk about that. Okay, we got to talk about that. But I'm going to do a ministerial etiquette scope honorarium where the music ministry is concerned. Now, that's going to be real heavy. That's going to be heavy. Okay. Um, all right. Somebody said something about dreams and visions. Somebody said something about dreams and visions. Are you still with me? Our worship is getting tainted because of the outright sins. Ooh. Yes, that will happen. That will happen. Okay. Mm. Mm. Okay, Kaylee Leon, what was what was your question about dreams and visions? All the show. Where's the real restaurant? Okay, Vicky. Here you go now. There you go. There you go. Uh, Kelly Leon, you okay? How can you interpret dreams and visions? Okay. Um, you know what? That's my wife's. That's my wife's gifting and anointing. That's my wife's gifting and anointing. Um, I'm gonna ask her to do a scope about it. Okay. Um, God deals with my wife prophetically in dreams and visions. 
her anointing for it is just it's it's incredible. Okay, when that woman dreams something, I tell people put it in the bank because it's bringing interest because that's just how accurate it is. Um, the the first thing I would I would say to you is is go through the scriptures as much as you can to see what God has to say about dreams and visions. Okay, um, and then there are some great books about interpreting dreams and visions. Um, email me. Oh, no, I, I have your email address. Okay, I'm, I'm going to email you some of the books that my wife uses for that, okay? Um, please, because I've been dreaming and seeing visions of spiders. Okay. Um, okay, okay, yeah. My wife, and I'm going to ask her to do a scope about it, okay? I'm going to ask her to do a scope because that's, that's how I don't mess with that. That God knows. I'm going to tell you all this real quick and we have to get off. We first got married. My wife had a dream, and 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 before we got married, she she had a house. Um, <laughs> she 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 was living in her parents' house, but she was managing the house, and she had a tenant in the house, and um, this particular tenant had a son. So then my wife moved out. Later on, we got married, and we were married. I think about I don't think it was six months. My wife had this dream, and the dream this particular tenant came, um, and dropped her son at our doorstep and left. My wife woke up and told me about the dream. We thought it was strange. So three days later, my wife ran into this particular sister. Now, they, they she no longer lives at the house. We're married. They've gone separate ways. They hadn't seen each other for a while. And she ran into her at her place of employment. She said, oh, Sister Pat, I was trying to get in touch with you because I wanted to see if you could take so-and-so and so off my hands for a time because I'm having some real serious issues and I can't keep him. It scared the it scared the daylights out of me, and that's when I realized, oh God, this woman has this gift. I cannot fool around with her. Okay, that's how sharp the dream gift of the the prophetic gift of dreams and visions is in my wife's life, and just over and over and over again, it has happened like that again. So I'm gonna ask her to do a scope about it. I'm gonna let you know when it's gonna happen. I'll email you about it, and that's her thing. But in the meantime. Do a topical search of the scriptures about dreams and visions, and then I'll get those book references to you when we go from there. Listen, people, I got to go. I can't, be, I can't believe I've been on this for almost two hours. Okay, this has been a long time. But I pray you all been blessed. Um, the, Lord, the Lord be with you all. Heaven smile upon you. Um, hey, 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 Vicky. God bless you. Thank you, too. Um, bless you, Kayla Leon. Um, we got a lot of people that got off, but it's, it's, it's great. We're good. Um, I just pray I shared something. Hey, Elder Janine, I just pray I shared something that just blessed the people of God and just um, just giving you a little bit more wind underneath your sails as you continue to mitigate uh, this sea of walking with the Lord. God bless you all. Have a great night. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And that this countenance upon you be gracious unto you, give you peace, and be with you now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray and say amen. Okay, thank you, Elder. Thank you for that. Tell my brother, uh... I need to talk with him. Tell my brother, I need to talk with him. I'm glad I'm you and Pastor to adopt a daughter before you two are on the world stage. Oh, my goodness. Glory be to God. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you so much. We received that, Pastor Alicia. And, and, and if that happens, we're going to bring you with us. And Naomi. And Naomi. Amen. Okay. Okay. We, we'll do. He needs to talk with you too. Okay, great. Okay, we're going to make that happen. All right. God bless you all. Have a great night. I love every one of you. Take care.